So today I'm talking to you about our spiritual freedoms. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Cesar. And uh, I really have my work cut out for me today. My, my work is to stay on this chair. No, no, I'm just going to put that there and I'm going to lean on it. But uh, I've got a real t- heavy task today. Uh, I got to speak to adults. How many know that's not a piece of cake? I, I got to preach and speak to adults. I also have to speak to children. I do pretty well speaking to adults, but speaking to children intimidates me immensely. I mean, it scares the fire out of me because kids can see right through you. I mean, if you're a phony, they'll spot you a mile away. So how many are going to pray for me? I'm not saying that I am a phony. I'm just saying if you are a phony, you know, the kids are going to really know it. But I got to talk to mom and dad. I got to talk to uh, the children all at the same time. And we're talking about freedom. We're talking about spiritual freedom. I thank God for, I'm an American. I thank God for this country. We're going to talk about that. We're going to celebrate our spiritual freedoms. We're also going to celebrate our national freedoms. So there's two passages of scripture text that we're looking at today. We do have notes loaded up on the YouVersion Bible app. If you download notes into your phone, we also have the handout sheet. If you didn't get one of the handout sheets, we always have these available in the back and you can follow along with the sermon notes. We're looking at Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, that will be our main text. And so if you want to find that, just put your finger in Galatians chapter 5. But while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and read for you John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. John 8, 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and we have never been enslaved to anyone. So how can you say that we will become free? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free Indeed. Say that with me. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Everybody say it together. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So we're going to talk about spiritual freedom. That's going to be our main reference today. But we also are going to talk about our national freedoms in the United States of America because we have a holiday. And I want to get the kids to involve with me and, and make this kind of a family event. We have a holiday coming up on Thursday. Now, on the count of three, everybody all at the same time, tell me what holiday we're going to be celebrating this coming Thursday. You ready? One, two, three. I heard at least a couple things. I heard some things. I'm not sure what they were, but, but I heard two things. I heard the 4th of July and I heard Independence Day. Of course, the 4th of July is our Independence Day. But Independence is really the holiday. It is a national holiday. Now, I've got several things that I've... um, Putting, putting in my notes to read to you. So if I'm looking down, I'm reading something to you. Independence Day, also known as the 4th of July, is a federal holiday in the United States of America commemorating the Declaration of Independence, which was ratified by the Second Continental Congress in July 4th, 1776. How, how many remember that? How, how many were there? Okay, we got a few that were there. 1776. Establishing the United States States of America as a free and independent nation. The founding fathers, the delegates of the Second Continental Congress, declared the 13 colonies were no longer subject and subordinate to the monarch of Britain, King George III, and were now united, free, and independent states. The Congress voted to approve independence by passing the Lee Resolution on July 2nd and adopted the Declaration of Independence two days later on July 4th, 1776, our National Day of Independence. This Thursday, we are celebrating Independence Day. We're celebrating it on the 4th of July, but it's not about 
fireworks. It, it's not about picnics. It, it's not about parties. It's not about a day off in the summer. It's about our independence as a nation that we are no longer under colonization by England. We are a free people, our own nation in the United States of America. We are a free people. Now, I want to ask you to uh, respond, and I want maybe get some kids' responses, but I'll, I'll take adults' responses as well. Why did the people in this part of the world rebel against uh, colonization of Britain, and why did we establish our country as an independent state? All right, where did I hear that? Was that you? Yeah, t- taxation. Okay, taxation. What else? So, say it real loud. Where, where's my kids at? Where, where's my homeschoolers at? So, say something real loud here, Josh. I'm sorry. He didn't know. Okay. Well, I heard, were you the one I heard of saying something? Bill of Rights. Okay, the Bill of Rights. Okay. Here, here's somebody with their hand up back here. Thank you, sweetheart. What did Grandpa tell you to say? Release ex feelum. All right, all right. That girl gets the blue ribbon. If, if you look up on, on Google, and, uh, and I did, just so you know, the first thing that will come up is high taxes to England. I, I've got a few quotes. Taxes such as the Sugar Act of 1764 and the Stamp Act of 1765 aimed at raising revenue from the colonies outraged the colonists and catalyzed a reaction that eventually led to revolt. Another reason was British control and domination. Another quote, the American Revolution was principally caused by colonial opposition to British attempts to impose greater control over the colonies and to make them repay the crown for its defense of them during the French and Indian War. But if you keep searching, in Google, they will not come up as the first reasons. But if you keep searching, you'll find that the real history is involving the freedom to worship God in the way that people desire to worship God without governmental control. And, and here is a quote. It took a while to find one, but here is a quote. In the 1600s and the 1700s, Europeans came to North America looking for religious freedom. Now, I'm going to tell you, a lot of what is being taught today and is being espoused, that it was taxation, that it was uh, you know, opposition to colonization, that it was new opportunities, it was all that. A, a lot of that is a revision. It is a rewriting of history. I, I mean, the reason people came to establish this country is to flee from the church state of, is, uh, uh, of England, the, 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 the state religion, and have freedom to worship the one true God in spirit and in truth according to the dictates and the desires of their heart. And I know that there are those that will tell us, oh, the people, the founding fathers, they're all deists. They, they believed in God, but they didn't think he was personal. I've got a question for those. Then why did they splatter all of those monuments in Washington, D.C. with verses from the Bible? Why, why did they establish everything about our Constitution that is based on the principles of the Word of God? Why is everything in America established as a Christian foundation if they were just seeking an escape from taxation or an escape from British control? They were looking to worship God in the way that they wanted to worship without governmental control. God's hand upon the founding of America was by providential design. And i got to pause here. I'm just really trying to teach today, and I've got my work cut out for me to keep everybody on the same page. I want to give you information and inspiration, a lot of things all at the same time. But let me tell you what, I have visited a lot of countries. I have visited African countries. I have visited South, Africa, South American countries. I've visited Central American countries. In fact, when I had... Oh, can I give you a quick report? I went to the doctor on Friday. He, he did a quick uh, echocardiogram of my chest, of my heart. And he said, Pastor... He didn't call me Pastor, but he should, because I'm going to keep witness to him. I walked into the office, and they said, how's it going? I said, with God's help, it's going great. And, and, and the lady says, oh, I see. So anyway... Uh, and it, uh, uh, he he did this check and he said, well, it appears to me like your heart is back to 
uh, health. So 100% health and, and still in rhythm. But my, my family doctor, he asked me, he's, he knows I go on missionaries trips because I have to take the shots for uh, Africa and so on. So he said, well, whatever countries have you visited? I listed him in the name of countries. And he said, oh, well, there, there's a unique thing that can happen in the South, Af- South American country. And he made the name of it and said, we got to check maybe that you contracted that. So he did that particular test on me and it came back negative. Thank God. I, I've been to a lot of different countries countries and there is no country like this country there is no nation on the face of the earth like the united states of america i think people would do well to visit other countries in fact i said this statement in the first service i think i'll just go ahead and repeat it you know we got a lot of liberal do-gooders in america today we got all these people that don't want to acknowledge our foundation on the bible and want to change our country to become something i think we ought to give them an all expenses paid trip to another country and when they come limping back home with their tail between their legs they will realize how good it is to be an american the proud the free people of the United States of America. You say, Pastor Coates, that sounds like a pro-American statement to me. You better believe it is. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, that old adage is still true. America, love it or leave it. You either love this nation and support it or you go somewhere else. where where you We, we will allow you to leave if you don't want to be here. We will buy you a one-way plane ticket if you don't want to be here. But hear this. For, for, for the love of God, it is so hypocritical. I'm, I'm off on notes here, but... I'm just exploding some of this so I don't uh, forget about it for, for later on. If the elites in Hollywood want to take all the billions of dollars that American capitalism has made it possible for them to have in their pockets, it is entirely hypocritical for them to turn around and try to destroy the capitalistic culture that has provided the untold wealth of the people that is available to them. Don't talk to me about communism and socialism when you may all your money on American capitalism. You see how extremely uh, hypocritical that is? And, and you say, Pastor Coach, you sound like a capitalist. You know, I'm not real sure about you. You do all those money talk stuff. You sound like you're money hungry. I, I'm not money hungry. I'm kingdom hungry. And I want to see America continue to use the dollars that God provides to preach the gospel in all the world. And the one reason among, well, I'm ahead of this. Let, let me get back to, to this. Uh, uh, I want you to to realize that this revision of history has been going on for years. Now, I'm old. Don't quote me on that, but it's true. What I just told you about them fleeing England for American independence to worship God is what I was taught word for word in elementary school. And that's changed immensely. Take a look at this. That's down at the bottom, Pam. There are those who would have us believe that the United States has reached the zenith of its power, that we're weak and fearful, reduced to bickering with each other. I don't agree that our nation must resign itself to inevitable decline. America is the richest, freest nation the world has ever seen. But as a father of six, I look around and all signs tell me something is sick in the soul of our country. And history tells me that we're headed for disaster if we don't change our course now. The set of ideas that is being implemented and advanced in this capital at this time is terribly frightening to people who are students of history. If you look at the 70 superpowers in history, every single one of them has called themselves exceptional. When you look at the Roman Empire, the parallels to what is going on in America are absolutely frightening. And the question is, are we going to go the right path ourselves, or are we going to continue down the wrong path that so many nations have fallen into? 
I went on a journey to retrace the footsteps of our forefathers to see if they left us some kind of a map that would guide us back to the foundation of America's success. When I think of pilgrims, I think of what I was taught in history class. I think of pilgrims coming over in these funny black and white suits with big hats and belt buckles on their shoes. <laughs> these are the people out of the box. These are the radicals of the day. Can you imagine? Chained here, and you're open to the elements. You can read about places like this. You can smell the history. You can't fake this. Welcome to Mayflower 2. So we have 102 people yeah. in this area. Look at that. I mean, can you imagine you're going to be sharing that? It's actually quite comfortable. <laughs> what I discovered is that our history has not just been forgotten, it's been rewritten. I'm stunned just what's on this table. I mean, this alone would, would change everyone's perspective about what made America such a great nation. Time is flying by too quickly, and our children's futures won't wait. We've got to do something now. Why is this monument not being showcased more? It is illustrating the principles of what this country is all about, and it's falling apart. There is nothing in today's America that cannot be solved by a genuine going back to the American first principles. That's good news. Very good news. Yes. I'm looking for good news. This is the most important journey of my life. My family is worth fighting for, and so is yours. All right, you can fade that down. If you don't know, there's a movie out. It's called Monumentalist. Uh, Christian actor Kirk Cameron that stars in that and I think produced it. Uh, Steve Simpson, one of our elders, first turned me on to that movie uh, quite a number of years ago. But I, I would encourage you, you and your family to watch it. The facts remain that America is the greatest nation that has ever existed on the face of the earth, founded on biblical principles and has become a bastion of Christianity in the world. And I believe there's two reasons for that. I believe that number one, that the nation that has supported the nation of Israel has been blessed immensely. God has blessed America because of Genesis 12, three, I will bless those who bless you and whoever dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The second reason is because the American dollar has funded world evangelism for the last century. The American dollar has been highly instrumental in taking the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ around the world. So if we ever stop doing those two things, our future is limited. But if we continue on that path of supporting Israel and taking the gospel and preaching it around the world and get back to our roots, get back to our family, Foundation. The monument that is depicted in the movie has four sides that all depict the four principles that have been the foundation of the culture in America. And as far as I'm concerned, it all comes down to the fact that God has blessed this nation. Now, let me ask you a question. Has America been supernaturally blessed by God? And has become the nation that has been great? Or has America been a nation that has become great and consequently been blessed by God? Did you understand that question? I had it worded for you a little bit better. Did God birth America as a great nation to do great things? Or did God make America great because we have done some great things for God? You want to know my answer to that question? My answer is yes. God has birthed this country to be a great nation to do great things, and we have become a great nation that has done great things because of the blessing of God. But today, for a little while, I want you to look at the book of Galatians. So if you still have your finger there in Galatians chapter 5, this is going to be our Bible lesson and our, our, our text for today. And I want to give you some parallels between our spiritual freedom in Christ and our national freedoms as Americans, as citizens of the United States of America, because there really are some parallels between spiritual liberties and national liberties. Number one, both were very costly to achieve. You know, freedom is never uh, free, uh, or it is free, but it's not cheap. And uh, it costs a lot 
for us to sit in this room as a free country. It costs the blood of soldiers. It costs people leaving their um, loved ones. It, it costs a great high price that we can sit here, we can worship God, we don't have any fear that the government's going to come and shut us down or anything like that. And, and those liberties and freedoms were, were not without a very high cost. On Memorial Day a few weeks ago, we made the statement, all gave some, but some gave all. And again today, as Americans, myself included, we say thank you to anyone in the house that had served in the United States military. And we say thank you, thank you, thank you for, for your commitment, for your sacrifice, for what you did to make America a great nation. Look at this statement. Freedom does not come without blood being shed. And that is true both nationally and spiritually. The blood of the soldiers that was shed so that we could be a nation of free people. Also the blood of our Savior which was shed on Calvary's cross so that we can have the Christian and spiritual freedoms that we have. Now I don't know that you will know this. There might be a few. But um, in 1974... That was before the flood, by the way, you know, before Noah and Moses and all those people. 1974, there was a song that came out. I was just in diapers in 1970. No, no, really. I was a teenager, and I remember this song. In 1974, a song was written by um, Neil Inlow called The Statue of Liberty. Let me remind you of those words. Verse number one, in New York Harbor stands a lady with a torch raised to the sky. And all who see her know she stands for liberty for you and me. Chorus, I'm so proud to be called American, to be named with the brave and the free. I will honor our flag and our trust in God and the statue of liberty. Verse number two, on lonely Golgotha stood a cross with our Lord raised to the sky. And all who kneel there will live forever as all the saved can testify. I'm so glad to be called a Christian, to be named with the ransom and whole. As the cross, or as the statue liberates the citizen, so the cross liberates the soul. If you're thankful for that, come on, give the Lord a great big thank you, Jesus, today. So both freedoms were very costly to achieve. Number two, both must never be taken for granted. We must never sit in this room and take for granted we have freedom in this nation. We must never sit on our blessed assurances and thank God for the freedom that we have as Christians. We must be very thankful. We must always give thanks to God that has made us free people. But thirdly, our freedoms must be aggressively maintained. Both our national freedom and and our spiritual freedoms, they must be very aggressively maintained. And that's what Galatians chapter 5 is all about. I don't know if you know this, but uh, just a little teaching time for you this morning. The book of Galatians, written by the Apostle Paul, was written for a very specific reason. And uh, so we're going to be giving an exposition today about our spiritual freedoms from the book of Galatians, chapter 5 particularly. We, we learn uh, three important things. Number one, we are free from the guilt of past sins. Look at the very first verse. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Spiritual liberty means that we are free from the guilt of past sins. How many are thankful today that you're free from the past? Aren't you thankful today that God took our sins and he put them in the sea of his forgetfulness, never to be remembered against us again? The Bible says we are separated from our sins as far as the east is from the west. And I, I know I'm, I'm going to linger here for just a second, but God did not say he separated our sins as far as the north is from the south because the day I got saved, come on, think about this. This is how my mind works. If you want to see into my brain, then here's a great opportunity. If God would have saved me the day I confessed Jesus and he started me going north and he started my sin going south, what would have happened <laughs> about 24 hours later? My sin would have met me on the other side 
side of the world. But God started my sin going east, and he started me going west, and my sin could circle the globe 10 times, and I could circle the globe 10 times the other direction, and east will never become west, and west will never become east. North will eventually come become south, and south will eventually come north. But my sins keep going further and further and further from me every day that I live because I am free from the guilt of past sins. Now, somebody in the room ought to be really thankful for that. Come on, somebody. Secondly, we are free from the fear of death. Now, this is not from Galatians. I just wanted to drop this in because it's an opportunity to, to show you one of my favorite passages in all the Bible, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he, that is Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Because of Jesus, the fear of death is gone from the life of of the believer, because we know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We have had people in our church, dear uh, Tina Bates lost her husband just the other day, uh, a week ago. He, he went to be with the Lord, and I just want to share her testimony. I'm taking her thunder, but uh, when they had this uh, trauma in his life and were rushed to the emergency room, there were 30 minutes there that they had together before he went into eternity. And he had given his life to Christ years and years ago, but over the years, he had gotten away from God. He had gotten into a lifestyle that was doing things that were unhealthy. And she said to him, you know, all these years, you, you were remembered your, your time that you gave your life to Jesus. He began to cry. And he said, oh, yes, I've wasted so many years. And he repented right there in the emergency room and asked Jesus Christ to forgive him of all of his sins. And God walked washed him clean, and that was 30 minutes before he went out into eternity. Oh, come on, somebody. Give a praise to Jesus for that. Hallelujah. But we are free from the fear of death. And then number three, we are free from the demands of the Judaizers. So if you have your Bible, at Galatians chapter 5, the first verse says, for freedom... Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, defend it and preserve it, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. There are, there were, in New Testament times, people that were called the Judaizers. Now, the Judaizers were a particular group of people. They were very common in the New Testament time that believed that you could be saved, believed that you had to ask Jesus Christ into your heart, believed that Jesus rose from the dead, all those principles of Scripture, but they took the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and they added to it all these legal expectations. In fact, they said, yes, you accept Jesus, you pray, you repent, you, you're, you're washed clean by the blood of Jesus, but now you're still under obligation to keep all the requirements, all the laws, all the stipulations of the entire Old Testament. In other words, you have to add to your salvation. How many are thankful we're saved by the blood of Jesus with absolutely nothing added to it? It's not the blood of Jesus plus our holiness. It's not the blood of Jesus plus our good works. It's not the blood of Jesus plus our tithing or our church attendance or how many hours a day we pray. It's the blood of Jesus Christ with nothing else added. And it is the gift of God unto eternal life. But they say, no, no, no. There's, there's hundreds, hundreds, of hundreds of, of laws you got to keep. D did I mention this last Sunday? In, in the garden with Adam and Eve, how many rules were there? I mean, how hard could it be, people? We had more rules than that in our house when my kids were growing up. But in the garden, they only had one rule. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. Adam and Eve broke the one law. So religion came along and said, okay, if man can't keep one law, 
we're going to multiply it to a factor of 10. <laughs> and the law of Moses came along and said, oh, there's no longer one law. Now there's 10 commandments. And then when the rabbis came along in the Torah, and they said, well, people can't keep the 10 commandments. You know, that, that, that's too hard. So, so we got to multiply it uh, uh, 36 times over. And there were 613 rules and laws of the Torah. I don't know if anybody has any Jewish roots, but they call this a mitzvah, 613 laws of the Torah, 365 of them were negative, the thou shalt nots, 248 of them were positive, the thou shalt, and so religion took one law, turned it into 10, the rabbis took 10 and turned them into 613, when in all reality, if we just get back to Jesus, he said the first and the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So the Judaizers then came along and said, well, you got to keep all 100, 613 laws. You, you got to keep them all. You, you, if you've, and, and the book of James, by the way, says, if you've ever at one time ever broken one of the laws of God, guess what? In the eyes of God, you're like a lawbreaker. You're guilty of breaking all of them. Now, what's the obvious problem with that? If Adam and Eve couldn't keep one law, now, I'm not commenting upon you. I'm not commenting upon family first. I'm not commenting about uh, Cesar and Brandon. Well, I'm just talking about in general terms. If mankind can't keep one law, then what do you think is going to happen when God gives us 10 laws? And then what do you think is going to happen when the Torah gives us 613 laws? It's not going to get better. <laughs> in fact, it is absolutely humanly impossible for anyone to keep all of the 613 laws. But that's what the Judaizer said. By the way, can, can I just tell you this? That God never intended, this might help somebody, God in the Old Testament never intended a person to justify himself by the keeping of the law. Pastor Coates, do you believe in the Ten Commandments? Absolutely. Are you thankful that the uh, state of Louisiana has passed the resolution that says they got to be posted in public schools and public buildings? Absolutely. Are, are you thankful that we should live by the Ten Commandments? Absolutely. Do I think that the Ten Commandments law keeping will get a person's heart right with God? Absolutely not. God never intended that to be the way to obtain righteousness. The, the Torah was never intended. If you keep all the 613 laws, then you're going to be righteous. I mean, God have mercy. I probably broke half of them today. I mean, if I have any piece of clothing on that's polyester, it's like a mixed fiber, I'm a lawbreaker. I'm breaking the law of God. If, 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 if there is a weed in the churchyard... The groundskeeper is a lawbreaker. He, he's a sinner because there's not supposed to be any weeds in our grass. And God forbid, if you had bacon this morning for breakfast, you are a lawbreaker. Can't have bacon, can't have pork chop, can't have uh, spare ribs. Uh, man, I tell you what, I just don't think I could, could live that way. In fact, I don't have to live that way. That's what the point is of the whole Judaizers. No, but the Apostle Paul said, it is for freedom that you have been set free in Christ. Do not use your freedom to submit again to a yoke of slavery. So I want to ask you two questions then about this thing called Christian liberty. What is Christian liberty and what isn't? What it is and what it is not. Let's start with number one. What, what Christian liberty is, okay? He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Are we free? Yes. All right. What does that mean? It means there is a release from the ceremonial law of God. All the do's and don'ts, all the rules and regulations, all the commandments and the obligations. I mean, man couldn't keep one law, much less 10, much less 613. And they were never given to show man that he could be righteous before God. In fact, the book of Romans answers one question. Then why did God give the law? As a written code that people could somehow earn their salvation? Absolutely not. The reason he gave the commandments and all the laws of Moses were to prove to people that they could not 
keep the commandments. So they would call out on Jesus and realize, I can't save myself. I need a Savior that can provide the way of salvation for me. And that's why Jesus was God and man at the same time. 100% God that was sinless. 100% man. But when the sinless man, God, God, man, went to the cross, he satisfied the just laws of God. And in the person of Jesus Christ, that sacrifice was accepted in the heavens. And when I asked Jesus to take lordship of my life, the atonement of his blood that was shed that day covers all of my sin because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. So there's freedom from the release of the ceremonial law. My mentor friend, pastor years ago, used to always say this, the, the, the law was a powerless negative. Now think about that. It continually said, thou shalt not, but never gave man any power to live any differently. The law of God said guilty, 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 but never gave mankind any power to think or live any differently. It continually said, thou shalt not commit adultery, but never gave mankind the power to stop lusting. It said, thou shalt not steal, but never gave mankind the power to stop coveting his neighbor's possessions. It said, thou shalt not murder, but never gave mankind the power to stop hating. So was the law bad? Absolutely not. In fact, it was right. It was proper. It was a reflection of the righteousness, nature, and the character of God. Don't ever get the idea that the law of God was bad, that the law of God was, was a bad book, that it was a bad thing. And that's what a lot of people think. Just because the, the law of God was bad, God had to give us a, a new covenant. Just because the God of the Old Testament died, now we have a kinder, gentler God of the New Testament named Jesus. No, no, no. It's all the same. Jesus the same yesterday, today, forever. It's all one book. It is all the word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the laws of God will never pass away. But the Old Testament law was given for the purpose so that we could see how much we needed a Savior and put our hearts in relationship with Jesus Christ. So even though we're free from the ceremonial law, there remains a responsibility to the moral law of God. Now, this is where I'm going to get down to business for a moment. Just because I'm no longer obligated to keep the law as a legal code that gives me a salvation. No, that's not how I get saved. I don't get saved by keeping a legal code, but neither does that give me permission to live my life any old way I want to. The moral law of God that stood behind the Mosaic law is still true. If there were certain things about God that are revealed in the pages of the Old Testament, God's nature, God's character, his holiness, his purity, his unity, his integrity, his benevolence, his omnipotence, I could go on and on. Everything that is revealed about God through one of these Old Testament laws is still true today. And I cannot keep them to fulfill my legal standing, but that does not mean mean I have permission to tread upon the nature and the character of God. Let me give you an illustration of this. The moral law today, the law of Christ is really more demanding and more challenging than the Mosaic law because the law of Moses said what? Thou shalt not commit adultery. The law of Jesus said, don't even look upon a woman with lustful intentions you've committed adultery in your heart. The law of Moses said what? Thou shalt not murder. It's wrong to kill another person. But Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment and whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council and whoever says you fool will be liable to the fire of hell. How many know this thing's not getting easier? This thing's getting harder. But it's not getting harder for us to try harder to keep it. It's getting harder for us to, to realize the only way we can keep it is by the love of Jesus Christ shed and brought in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside. Because the law of Moses said, thou shalt not steal. Don't look at something that somebody else has and go take it from them. That's sin. Jesus turned along and said, we learned to, need to learn to be content 
with everything we have. The apostle Paul says, I've learned in whatever situation I'm in to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to be bound. I've had, this, the, the, I've had plenty. I've been in hunger. And I can do all things with Christ. That strengthens me. Are you, are you tracking with me? Moses said, thou shalt not lie. Jesus said this, and I love this. I wish I had this one on the screen. I didn't in the first service. But James chapter 5, verse 12 says this. And this would be a great verse for you to mark. James 5, 12. Above all my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall unto condemnation. What did Moses said? M Moses said, don't tell a lie. What does the New Testament come along and say? The New Testament comes along and say, live with such integrity that everything that you say that comes out of your mouth doesn't have to be uh, backed up. In other words, you don't have to give some disclaimer about it. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Here's my way of, of illustrating this. Let's say that uh, Tyler and I are having, a, that's what you get for sitting on the front row, my friend. I'm, I'm sorry, this is the way it is. I always pick on the people. That I, I, I'm off of Brandon and Cesar now, so I'm on to, on to uh, Tyler. You're laughing too loud. I'm going to get on you next. But uh, let's say that uh, Tyler and I are having a conversation. I'm, I'm just telling him all this stuff. He's nodding his head like he believes everything. And, and then I say this, but Tyler, the honest truth is, when I say that, what's he going to think? What was all that other stuff? I mean, you were just talking. You were just flapping your gums. You, and, and then you're, you're going to have to qualify what you're going to say next. The honest truth is this. I'm trying to get his attention, but what's that illustrating? That's illustrating that I'm apparently not thinking that there's accountability for, for what I said previously. That's why James says, let your yes be yes and your no, no. If you're going to speak truth, just speak it all the time. You, you don't have to say, you know, well, the honest truth is, well, I'm going to really tell you something. Just, just say it. Are you tracking? I think this is a really important verse for, for people to get in our hearts because we should live with such uh, integrity. We should live with such purity of our conversation that every word that comes out of our our mouth should be true. And we shouldn't have to qualify and say, well, you know, now I'm really going to tell you the truth. We should be telling the truth all the time. And everybody said, amen. amen. So the, the legal law of Moses said, keep all the rules, keep all the commandments. That's the only way to endeavor to get right with God. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that's what Christian liberty is. It's freedom to obey. But here's what it is not. Liberty is not freedom to do whatever you want, including what is wrong. True liberty is the freedom to do what is right. John 8, 34, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Right? Right? Two verses later, he says this, so if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. So if the Son sets us free, are we free to disobey? No, we are free to obey. We are free not to do the wrong thing. We are free to do the right thing because he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Practice sin, you become the servant to sin, the slave to sin. You can say the devil made me do it. You can say I can't help myself. You can say I try harder and harder. You can say I can't seem to live this Christian life. I just don't have enough willpower. Or you can let Jesus come into your heart by his Holy Spirit, and then out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So if the Son on the inside sets you free, then you're free to obey because of his power living on the inside. So listen to this. <laughs> Anytime you get too many eyes in a conversation, you're headed for a problem, right? Too many egos, too many eyes. And in the latter portion of Galatians 5, there are three words that all start with the letter I that tell us our spiritual freedom does not give us permission to indulge, to injure, or to ignore. It does not give us permission to indulge the flesh, to injure others, or to ignore 
the law. And let me just teach this for you a moment. The freedom in Christ does not give us permission to indulge our flesh. Verse 13, for you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Just because I'm free, that does not give me freedom to indulge my flesh. That does not give me freedom to do whatever I want to do because the flesh must be crucified. The flesh is our old desires. It's our, it's our passions. It's the things that must be brought under our subjection to, to Jesus. And a lot of people w- would love if we could have an altar call, if we could have a special service, if we could have an exorcism service where, where all the flesh can be cast out. Wouldn't that be great? You know, wouldn't that be wonderful if we could cast out the, the demon of lust or the demon of, of lying or the demon of, of, um, uh, of uh, whatever, but, but we don't cast out the works of the flesh, the works of the flesh must be crucified. And that takes a whole lot more effort than someone laying their hand on us and casting out something from our spirit. So we must crucify the flesh. And that's an everyday, diligent process. We have the freedom to do it because we're free in Christ. We don't have the freedom to rebel against Christ, but to obey Christ, but not to indulge the flesh because indulging of the flesh would then also lead to the injuring of others. Look at the last part of verse 13. Right there on the screen, go back for me. Uh, use your, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. I'm free, but I am not free to do things in my life that would hinder or injure you in your spiritual life. Now, this is pretty deep stuff. It's okay. This is not normally Sunday morning stuff. And in just a few minutes, we're going to work through this. How many can think of something, and I'm just going to be random here, so there's not a, a pointed illustration, but something that is in your mind. How many of you can think of something that uh, a friend of yours uh, feels like is wrong for a Christian, but you particularly don't have that conviction about it? Okay or got about 10%. Now, maybe I didn't explain that very well. Maybe, maybe a friend of yours says, well, it's wrong to do this. Okay, I'll, I, I really thought about this years ago, and here was the illustration that I came up with. I lived in a town, and this astounded me, Pastor Cesar. The men's ministry of one church in town set it as their national goal that year that they would promote recycling. Okay, that, that was their contribution to the culture of that town. They were going to initiate recycling. And, and so I'm there, and I'm thinking, well, you know, I don't really feel like I'm sinning if I don't recycle. If, if a person feels that it's a sin to not recycle, but you particularly have not that conviction in your heart, then I don't think you have to recycle. But I don't think you should drop your garbage on their lawn. Come on, I'm just trying to, you know, sometimes you have tax, sometimes you just got a nail on it. That's what this scripture is saying. If you have convictions that may be different from another person's convictions, you live by the convictions of your heart. You will answer to God. The sins of the father visited on the generation of the third and fourth generation, but the soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. You will not stand before God and give account for someone else's convictions. You will not stand before God and be judged by someone else's uh, works of God. You will stand and give an account for the spirit of God working in your own life. But that does not give you a permission to lord it over or to injure or to... Um, the, Paul talks about this a lot in the Corinthian letter. He talks about uh, uh, the conscience that does not give us permission to make another person feel injured in their faith. Everybody, everybody tracking with me on that? And then lastly, it does not give us permission to ignore the law. Let me go back to the verse which says this. For you were called to be freedom, 
or verses 14 and 15. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. I don't have the right to indulge the flesh, injure others, ignore the law. But I have a right to live free in Christ so that I can have the freedom to do those things that God wants me to do. So what is the um, best way that Christian liberty is expressed? The answer is verse 16. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walking by the Spirit, expressing the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The best way for me to walk in freedom is not to indulge or injure or ignore other people with my freedom, but to walk in the Spirit and express these nine qualities of Christ-likeness. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Did you ever think about this? This verse does not talk about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Not only would that be wrong grammatically, it would be wrong biblically. Because there are not nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. There's one fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is a lifestyle of Christ-likeness. And the lifestyle of Christ-likeness is exemplified by those nine things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And my walking in the Spirit is the way that my spiritual freedom is leading me in Christ. So today, I just thought on this all in Sunday, we'd kind of do a little Bible study here about our spiritual freedoms and how thankful we are for the spiritual freedom that we have in Christ but also to remind you that as a nation of Americans, we have a national freedom and we need to be thankful and we must never take for granted and we must aggressively maintain the national freedoms that we have because this country is the greatest country on the face of the earth. I've been, to, I've been to many other places. I've visited several different continents. I've been in Africa. I've been in Cuba. I've been in South America, Central South America. I've been all the way down to the point of South America, the country of Chile. I've been in a lot of different countries, and there is no country like this country. We need to be thankful for it. Are there some problems in this country right now? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are we going to continue to pray? Are we going to continue to vote? Are we going to continue to influence and try to get this nation steered back to our foundational moorings? Absolutely. But it's still the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And we need to be thankful to God for our independence as Americans and our independence spiritually as Christians. So would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes this morning? I want to ask you this question. It's really the only question that matters. Not if you're a good person, not if you keep the law, not how many of the 613 have you broken, but have you fulfilled the law of love? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Have you asked Jesus, which is the only way that you can be saved, ask Jesus that by the authority of his shed blood on Calvary's cross, come into your life. And and by his atonement, paying the price that he didn't know and a price that you couldn't pay, but he paid it for you because he is the savior of all. If you've never made that commitment to Christ and ask him to be the Savior and Lord of your life. I encourage you on this independent celebration day to find freedom in Jesus. Freedom from fear. Freedom from guilt. Freedom from the fear of death. 
freedom from bondage, freedom from overbearing life, controlling habits, freedom in Christ. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. If that's you this morning, shoot your hand up with me real high. I want to pray with you today. Pastor Coates, I need to do that today. Make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. Give Jesus complete authority to be my Savior and my Lord. Maybe some of the children, maybe some of the younger people. I need to do that today. I need to make Jesus the Lord of my life. How many can wave your hand at me and say, but I have done that, and I'm thankful. Just go ahead and lift it up as a testimony. I have done that, and it's my intention to continue to walk in the Spirit and continue to express the ninefold spirits of the Holy Spirit that exemplify Christ's likeness in my life, not by might, not by power, but by the Holy Spirit in my life. Would you stand to your feet with me, if you would, please? We sang a little song at the end of the first service. Pastor Meredith's going to help us. We're just going to sing this right now just a couple of times through. I'm so thankful I'm an American. But I'm even a thousand times more thankful that I'm a Christian, that God has been faithful to me. You have been faithful. Thank you, God. One more time, lift your voices, sing it together. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am in, I will sing of the good. I'm not sure. I think Pastor Jim and Ruth are probably outside getting everything ready for our uh, fun time this afternoon. But we had uh, VBS the week before this week. How many remember our VBS? Where's all my kids? All came out to VBS. We had great crowds of kids in our fellowship hall for VBS. And uh, we took a missions offering in VBS. And the boys were competing with the girls. Has, has anybody heard about that? And, and somebody made up like an incentive, a challenge, that, uh, that what was going to happen? I really can't remember. Help, help me out, kids. It, whoever collected, if the boys or the girls collected the most amount of money for missions, something was supposed to happen. What was it? Yeah. If, if the boys collected the most amount of money for missions, then cold ice water was going to get dumped on Pastor Meredith's head. Or if the girls raised the most for missions, then cold ice water was going to get dumped on Pastor Coates' head. Who won? How did, it, how did it turn out? Oh, you don't know? You're going to find out in about 10 minutes. Okay, so if you want to go out under the porta cache, give us a chance to change our clothes just in case something went wrong. I'm going to change my clothes real quick, get Pastor Meredith a chance to change her clothes real quick. We'll meet out under the porta cache. We'll, uh, we'll find out who won and who lost, and then uh, we'll launch you for the day. 
Water slides and games and activities will be open. The food trucks should be there. You can start getting your lunch. We're cooking, grilling hot dogs for you. I, I believe a hot dog and a, a bag of chips with free water is going to be two bucks. So, I mean, you can't beat that except at Sam's Club. Is it still a dollar and a half at Sam's Club? We're almost as good as Sam's, but, but not quite. So, two bucks for a hot dog, a bag of chips, and water, or the uh, Cali Street Tacos, Street Tacos, those are absolutely phenomenal. So have an awesome, awesome afternoon today enjoying your recreation.